Well, the Tigers lose big in game one of the ALDS. We'll talk about that as well as talking about what they need to do to right the ship here the rest of the way. All today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Monday, October 7th, 2024. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Booking.com, Booking. Yeah, the right stake can make you a fan of any city, even your baseball rivals, Book today on Booking.com, the official accommodation partner of Major League Baseball. Get the Booking.com app today. Welcome in, everybody. Happy Monday. Hope you all had a fantastic weekend. The Detroit Tigers, unfortunately, did not add to said fantastic weekend. They lose in brutal fashion over the weekend. And there's different kind of brutal losses, right? We have our brutal losses that are heartbreaking and it's, Oh, you, you blew a lead in the ninth or you lost by a run and you just couldn't like it. Like if I was a a Royals fan like that, that loss to the Yankees really would have stung a lot this weekend, right? This was brutal because it was completely uncompetitive from nearly the very, very, very beginning, right? Um, Obviously the Tigers took the first at bats in this game as it was in Cleveland, but Cleveland scored five runs before recording an out in the bottom of the first inning. They end up winning seven to nothing. Cleveland is obviously they in that context there. You got punched in the mouth. You got absolutely punched in the mouth. There's no way around it. This is not a, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and be like, oh, well, you know, this game actually wasn't as, it was not great. Uh, it was not great for a lot of reasons. And I think that, the overlooked reason as to why it wasn't great was actually the offense. I think a lot of people are focusing on the decision to use Tyler Holton and the pitching and, and the you know, again, giving up five runs before recording an out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you had really uncompetitive at-bats for a lot of this game. Uh, the, the offense got absolutely diced. And as we talked about on Friday's episode, man, th- this is one of the better bullpens, like, legitimately, this is one of the best bullpens I've ever seen in Cleveland. It, it, it's Well, it's one of the best bullpens I've ever seen, period, and, and, and talking about the Cleveland Guardians bullpen. It's, it, it's, it's remarkable how good and, and how talented everybody in their pen is. That's a, that's a whole stable full of guys with sub two ERAs. They're remarkable. And so if you don't have a lead – when the starting pitcher gets pulled, you're toast. You are in deep, deep stuff. You are in big trouble. And the Tigers were applying some pressure to Tanner Bybee, which is like the weirdest part of this entire thing. Like they they were getting some base runners on Bybee. He didn't have a very efficient outing. I don't even think he went five innings. He went, what, four and a third, four and two thirds? Four and two thirds? And he was good. I'm not trying to discredit his outing. He was good. The Tigers couldn't consistently hit him, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk about that as the show goes along here. But you know what I mean? Like th- th- this was a- an instance in where you applied pressure. You had runners in scoring position in the first, you know, four or five innings of the game. You couldn't score anybody. And then you had to deal with a, a-, a whole, basically, again, like a whole roster of sub two ERA guys. And that's, that's not a recipe for success. You, they are going to have to score early. If they want to have a chance of winning this series, they're not going to have comeback victories in, especially in the ninth inning they are not getting a comeback victory off of class a. And, and if that's, if they somehow do, and I'm wrong and that's clipped, beautiful, fantastic. He's given up five earned runs all season, man. Like I'm, I'm not holding my breath on that. So what went wrong? Again, we'll start with the first inning disaster. Five runs against before recording an out. Tyler Holton goes zero innings, zero plus. Two hits, three earned runs, one walk, no strikeouts. He wasn't great 
with his cutter command, which is so vital to his success. Um, you know, the cutter is such a good pitch for him and it's something that he utilizes to righties and lefties. And so, uh, I actually, I don't think he looked as bad as like not being able to record an out would indicate in a lot of cases. I, I think Cleveland was just kind of all over him and he was missing just enough to, to have a major league hitter pay for what he was offering, but he also didn't have any help defensively. Zach McKinstry, with a pretty brutal error there. I'm not saying it's an easy play. I'm not saying that was routine, um, but not even getting a like your body in front of the ball, letting it not only like you you don't record a single out and you can't make a play on a ground ball to third when you're the third baseman. On top of that, it goes completely by you and rolls in to left field. Absolutely brutal, and it, it just really felt like the moment was was getting too big for this scrappy team that we have all been rooting for so hard over the last couple of months and well, all season, obviously, but they've been on this run over the last couple of months. And then Reese Olsen comes in with two men on still nobody out and just absolutely grooves a slider hanger down the middle. Brutal. Okay. Offensively. I was, as I said at the beginning of the show, much more frustrated with the offense's inability to get back into this ballgame. A five-run inning against is obviously not good, but it was the first inning. You had the whole game to claw back, and you couldn't. You have to have the chip away mentality there, man. Like You don't need to answer with a five-run inning immediately after. You have eight innings at your disposal. You had time to get a run here, get a run there. And next thing you know, instead of having the best bullpen, you know, some of us have ever seen take the mound with a seven run lead. It's a two or a three run lead. Is it likely that you're going to win against it? Still no, but it's at least giving you a fighter's chance of making it a competitive ball game, making it a one swing ball game. And honestly, if you chip away, it probably changes who A.J. Hinch utilizes out of our bullpen. We're not going to Ty Madden, who gives up two more runs. Uh, It was just, it was so frustrating. Again, I had such a bigger issue with the offense in this game than than how the pitching ended up. And and like, again, I'm not trying to make it sound like the five-run inning was good. That was obviously terrible. Do not get it misconstrued, but... The game was not over after the first inning, and it felt like it. 14 strikeouts, four hits, two walks. Six base runners, 14 Ks is not a recipe for success. Let's get into some individual performers here from this game. Offensively, we'll talk about some pitching performances as well outside of Holton, who we already mentioned. And then we'll talk stuff. Got to talk about the rest of the series, okay? Because the the series is still very much on the table. This loss did not completely ruin your chances of uh, advancing to the ALCS here. We will talk about all of that right after this. Got to talk to you all today about our friends over at Arena Club. For most of us that like collecting cards, very much like myself, the idea of spending two grand or more on a Mahomes rookie card, a Luca rookie card, an Ellie De La Cruz rookie card just isn't in the cards, get it? I love collecting, but there's some serious money to drop in this industry. Thanks to Slab Packs from arenaclub.com, now it's possible to score gem mints for a fraction of the retail price. Every card that I listed was a hit from last week's Arena Arena Club Slab Pack drop. Arena Club is the only repack that provides real value, a complete view of all possible cards, and a clear hit rate for each one. Arena Club sales packs are revolutionizing the repack game with transparency. Whether into buying, selling, trading, or displaying, Arena Club is the card collecting platform you have to check out. And right now, you can get 10% off of your first slab pack or card purchase by going to arenaclub.com slash Locked on MLB and using code locked on MLB. That's arena club.com slash locked on MLB. Code locked on MLB, all one word, for 10% off of your first purchase. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Segment two of Locked on Tigers. Appreciate you all for tuning in. As always, making us your first listen every single day. Shots to the everydayers that do tune in 
every day. We will, of course, be back tomorrow recapping game two of the American League Divisional Series. Immediately following the game, be sure to check out Jake Reitma over at Locked On Tigers Postcast. He does Locked On Wolverines Postcast as well. Given given the city of Detroit, some immediate post-game reactions here are over at Locked On Sports Detroit. So um, talking about the offense, we talked about as a whole, it was obviously not effective. You got shut out. That's not great. Um, if there is a silver lining, well, we'll get into that a little bit later, I guess. We'll kind of do that with our big picture series kind of outlook here. Um, individually, Torkelson had a really rough day at the plate, man. 0 for 3 with two strikeouts. Had a brutal double play that completely just killed any momentum that the team thought they might have had to try to claw their way back into this game. Um, There was two men on, no out. First and second, no out. Double play, batter later, inning over. Not great, man. And then two strikeouts in his other two plate appearances outside of that double play. Just really not a great day at the office for him. Kerry Carpenter did have a hit, which is more than what a majority of the lineup can say. So I want to give him his credit and also say that he is still very much the team's best hitter against righties. I, I, I criticized him for swinging in this game. He swung and missed at every single ball at his eyes. It wasn't, they weren't in the strike zone. He did swing and miss at one third strike in the strike zone toward the end of the game. But literally every at bat, the pitchers were just throwing fastballs at his eyes and he was swinging and missing at every single one. And so I pointed that out and I had several people that were like, hey, you know, you you can't criticize him because he's the team's best hitter. I I think both can be true. I, 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 I want him to hit two in the lineup every single time we face a righty. I don't think he's terrible. But objectively, he has been swinging and missing at fastballs at his eyes for the better part of four weeks now. And it's an adjustment that he is going to have to make or else these postseason numbers for him that have not been very good are going to continue. And uh, so that's an adjustment I'm hoping that he can make. All he has to do is just spit on one. If he can just take one ball at his eyes at the beginning of a game, then that completely throws every pitcher the rest of the game off of the scent that he's going to just keep going back to that. But when you swing and miss at every one, it's a problem. So that's something that uh, that I'm hoping that he can make an adjustment on. Again, still very much the team's best hitter. Still want him in the lineup every single time a righty is on the bump. Uh, Riley Green, speaking of players who have had rough postseasons as a whole, Riley Green's postseason has been pretty rough, and we haven't talked about it much because this is the first time they've lost a game in the postseason, right? They swept in the wild card round. But, uh, yeah, he he has been swinging and missing a lot. Uh, the strikeout numbers are not great. Had another strikeout in this ball game goes over. Just seems like his rhythm and timing and, and the mechanics are just a little bit off enough uh, off enough to uh to, to really kind of throw him for a loop here and 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 look the playoffs are unpredictable they're 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 very very unpredictable in the game of baseball so I'm not gonna say they quote unquote necessarily need but like the, it's gonna be really tough for them to continue going forward if Riley Green does not turn it around pretty quickly here clearly again they showed they could win without you know having him be a catalyst in, in against the Astros. But it would really help a lot because he's not going anywhere in the middle of that lineup. And again, this is not just me trying to pick on like the best hitters and be like, where were you? This was everybody. Uh, Trey Sweeney, brutal day at the plate. Jake Rogers, brutal day at the plate. Matt Beerling, brutal day at the plate. Just didn't seem like anybody was seeing the ball very well. Uh, Really nothing went right on the offensive side of the ball. 0 for 5 with runners in scoring position after that torque double play, the team just really seemed to be done. And uh, that kind of was how it ended up being again, especially because of this Cleveland bullpen Uh, Ty Madden as well. Two thirds of an inning, one hit two earned runs, three walks and one strikeout. He just had no command. I actually really like how his stuff plays out of the pen. I think that he could be a pretty good long reliever when it's all said and done. And and, uh, I'd I'd imagine that's going to be a role that, he may play himself into going forward, especially in the immediate future of 2025. But focusing on where our feet are here, um, I, I really like the slider. Uh, it's kind of a power slider when he's coming out of the bullpen. When he's a starter, it's not that fast. It, it's much loopier 
uh, more of a, a, an 80s pitch. I mean, he was throwing that thing 90-something miles an hour uh, at one point in that game. And then the fastball plays a lot better out of the bullpen, too. It's just he had no command of it in this game, was just spraying everywhere. Um, glove side up, could not hit glove side up. It was trying to over and over and over again and just couldn't hit it whatsoever. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, th- that was kind of, uh, again, the, the, the offense clearly wasn't doing any, anything. Cleveland was about to go to their bullpen. It was kind of an uphill battle as is, but those two runs really kind of did feel like the nail in the coffin there. Let's talk about what went right. I, I don't think that this was as, I, I don't think that this was like an absolutely nothing went right game. Right, I, I do think that there was some stuff you can take out of it. Reese Olsen, after the home run, I thought was good, which is always a great caveat that you have to put on something. He did give up an absolute bomb, as we talked about in the uh, in segment one there. Just hung a slider. Five innings, three hits, one earned run, one walk, four strikeouts. Again, I think he settled in nicely once he was just starting with a clean frame and wasn't inheriting like a, a ridiculously not ideal situation there. Um, but he was still, still kind of sporadic, goodness, with his command throughout the game. He was hanging sliders a lot, um, I and, and he didn't get burned on very many the rest of the outing. But um, the one thing that really was a head-scratcher to me was he kept throwing sliders to lefties when he kept hanging them. I understand his slider is such a good pitch that ideally, and throughout the entire regular season, he has had no fear throwing that slider to righties or lefties. And he shouldn't. It's a really, really good pitch. In this outing specifically, I understand like sticking to your guns and it's like you you, you are who you are and, and you, you know, that you got to use what's got you here. I get it. But he continuously was hanging sliders to lefties. And just every time he threw one, it I, I was holding my breath. And then when he went to the changeup, it was incredible. His changeup looked absolutely phenomenal, legitimately some of the best that I think his changeup has looked over the last few weeks. So we'll see the next time that uh, that he is used, if he is used again in the Tigers' run here in the postseason. But uh, I, I thought that after the home run, he settled in pretty nicely there. Sean Gunther literally records one out. Good for him. And then Cater Montero, I thought was, uh, you know, definitely on the side of things that went right in this game. I loved going to him here. Um, he obviously makes the roster over Casey Mize. We'll talk about that a little bit in the final segment here. But um, two innings, one hit, no earned runs, no walks, three strikeouts. The stuff is just so good. And he was getting weak contact or swings and misses for his entire outing. And and I, I, I really liked what I saw out of him. Uh, they were talking about a lot of work that him and the coaching staff were doing while he wasn't playing in Houston and was preparing for Cleveland and was really all focused on Cleveland. So I think it's cool that A, he got an opportunity and B, looked as good as he did in it. Um, I don't anticipate him to pitch too much else in this series, right? Unless they they really need somebody to go a lot of innings. But in that case, you're talking about the series being potentially over anyway if they get uh, you know blown out again and have to do a mop-up role. So We'll see, but I, I thought he looked really good for whatever that's worth. And if they do need to go to him again against Cleveland in game four or five, I think they'll probably have no fear of doing so, given how well he looked there. So um, let's talk stuff. we got the roster to talk about, as I just mentioned there. Um, and then we're going to look ahead. We're going to talk about the rest of the divisional series. We'll talk about game two specifically, kind of what the Tigers need to do to get back on the horse here. We will do all of that right after this. Got to talk to you all today about our friends over at Booking.com. Booking. Yeah, explore those U.S. cities you've always secretly wanted to learn more about. With hotels, bed and breakfast, vacation rentals, resorts, and more, on Booking.com, you might just find your perfect stay even in your baseball rival city. During the postseason, maybe it's time to taste your baseball competitions, stadium cuisine. Look. Progressive Field. I keep wanting to call it Jacobs Field because that's what when I first went there when I was a, a youngin. That is uh, what the what, what the stadium was called. Great cuisine. Okay, great great hot dogs. Everyone knows about the mustard. It's fantastic. Credit where credit is due to Cleveland. Okay, I know we're we're a division rival. We're in the heat of battle here. Credit tip of the cap. Okay, and you should go try it out and root on your Detroit Tigers in Cleveland with Booking.com. Again, they can make you a fan of any U.S. city, even your baseball rivals. Booking.com, 
booking dot yeah also got to talk to you all about our friends over at FanDuel NFL fans you can start the season with a big hit on FanDuel America's number one sports book so when you get a bunch of I don't know uh We'll, we'll call it a hunch as well for rhyming purposes. In the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats, view live pay, play by play, and so much more on the same page where you get all of your bets. You get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's fanduel.com. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Third and final segment of Locked on Tigers. Appreciate you all for tuning in as always. So let's talk stuff. We're going to start off by talking about the roster here. So Cater Montero makes the roster over Casey Mize. I really have no issue with this. Uh, that is the only difference between the wildcard roster and the ALDS roster, by the way. That is it. Just Montero in, Mize out. Jackson Job still makes it. All the position players still make it just that difference. Um, and, and yeah, look, I, I think Mize is somebody who in the postseason, you really want swing and miss coming out of your bullpen. And Mize has pretty good numbers and, and has had some really good outings specifically against the Astros in his career. Montero pitched very recently toward the end of the year there against Chicago. So I think they went, you know what? We're going to put Mize on the roster if we really need him in Houston. And then Montero, we can have focus on Cleveland. If we get past Houston, he can be kind of the similar role, long inning, multi-inning type of pitcher in that case. You know, if they do continue, which I'm not getting ahead of myself, obviously they're down 0-1 to a team that had a better record than them. This is just purely hypothetical for the sake of this, you know, conversation. I'll be interested to see if they switch back and forth between the two of them the rest of the way, or if this is just going to be Montero's spot now. And does that have to do with when the most recent time Montero pitched was, right? Like if he pitches in game five and then the Tigers advance, is he not going to make the CS roster? Or is there enough days off where he can be used again, you know, by game two or three? I don't know. I, I think that that's kind of a, an interesting conversation. But as far as in a vacuum, Montero versus Mize, I think Montero has probably slightly better swing and miss stuff. And again, in this ball game, ended up looking pretty good. So I, I really have no issue with that, um, as far as managerial decisions go, uh, there was a couple that people were talking about in this game. A lot of people really uh, ended up, uh, I don't know, kind of dragging or, or or voicing frustration with the Holton opener because of how the first inning went. I, I understand hindsight, and, and he got rocked, and I, I, I get it. But this dude has been the best reliever in our bullpen for the entire second half. And we've been doing the opener bullpen chaos thing for like two months now. I I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't know why there was such a negative reaction. Maybe I, I mean, I do know why. It's because it, they got absolutely obliterated in the first inning. But but that's that again, that that's using hindsight, like going into the game, you're talking about, okay, we have our best reliever on the mound. Hopefully he can go out there and get a one, two, three inning to start off the ball game. And then we can hand it over to Reese with a clean slate. Obviously that's not what happened, but I, I, I had zero, like, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't have an issue with how we got here. Like we, 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 again, I, I've said it a million times over the last week and a half, two weeks, this team has had the best record in baseball since August 10th doing this. It's been scooble and a bunch of bullpen days and openers and, and, and stuff like that. I, I, just because it didn't work one time doesn't mean that that it's that that it was just like the the complete like dumbest thing ever to do. So um, I yeah, th this is th going forward. I guess my biggest point is this isn't going to change either. They are going to stick by what got them here. And that is using the bullpen a lot, playing matchups and using openers for everybody that's not named Tarek School. Looking ahead, game two is today, Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. You have Tarek Skubal against old friend Matthew Boyd because, of course, um, uh, just of course it is. This is now a must-win game you were not going to go undefeated in the postseason, okay? This is Matthew Boyd, who's been good for Cleveland since coming back from injury, but this is Matthew Boyd against the 
possibly soon to be unanimous Cy Young winner in the American League. If you want to win this series, you have to win this game. I don't like using must win game like that, that phrase, you know, must win game in, in the postseason because every game is, is kind of like really helps you out if you win. But, you know, we talked about it on Friday. If you walked out of game one and two in Cleveland with a split, that would be a huge win for you. That would be a huge plus for the Tigers. You can steal one on the road in the first two games and then essentially have home field advantage in the final three games of the series. Then you have to take two of three with two of three at home. But in order for that to happen, you now have to win on Monday. This was Cleveland's ace and all of their best relievers. If you would have asked me, hey, Bybee and the A team out of the pen in game one, you don't use Scooble. Game two, you do use Scooble. Which game do you think you're going to have a better chance of winning? I would have told you game two, and I think a lot of people probably also would have shared that sentiment, if not everybody. So it was an ugly loss. It was a, 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 an uncompetitive loss. And that aspect of it, I fully understand the frustration of, but the series is not over because you lost game one. This was always a just try and split, win whenever Scooble's on the mound, and then you have home field advantage in the last three games of the series. It also, if you are to win game two, sets it up so that Scooble can then pitch game five in Cleveland if you need it, which is fantastic to have in the back pocket. So this sucked. I'm not trying to tell you it didn't suck. It was brutal. It was awful to watch. I had a miserable time. You got completely outplayed and outclassed. It wasn't even remotely good. I don't know how many other ways I can say it. But the series is not over. And it actually, if you end up winning game two, you could even argue swings pretty heavily the Tigers' way again as far as momentum and, and odds of winning the series looking ahead if you can win on Monday. But you have to win on Monday. This is now a must-win game. Thanks for making Locked On Tigers your first listen. Every single day, shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every single day. We, of course, will be back tomorrow recapping said must-win game. Tarek Skubal, our, uh, our, our, our faith is in your hands, and hopefully the offense cannot get shut out for the second game in a row. Peace and love going to Therapy's Dope. I'll catch you all tomorrow, baby. Go Tigers.